In calculus, we learn how to study instantaneous rates of change of quantities. But before we can talk about instantaneous rates of change, we need to understand what average rates of change are. So let's look at an example here. Imagine that we have uh, companies whose annual profits are given for a number of different years, in this case for between 2005 and 2010, as shown in this graph. And what we would like to do is come up with the total change in the annual profit over this five-year period first. So the total change is going to be the difference between what the profit was at the end of the period and what the profit was at the beginning of the period. So we're just going to do a subtraction to find that. We're just going to subtract the profit in 2010, which was $33.6 million, minus the profit in 2005, which was $20.4 million leaving us with a difference of $13.2 million. So from the beginning of this period to the end, the total change was $13.2 million. But a lot of times what we're interested in is not just the total change, but the rate at which that change occurred. Like on average, how much did it change each year? So what we could do here is take the total change and divide it by the amount of time that elapsed. In this case, the difference in time was five years. So if we express this as a rate, we would take the $13.2 million divided by the five years that passed, giving us a rate of $2.64 million per year. This is what we call an average rate of change. Note that we're not claiming that the company's annual profit increased by $2.64 million each year. Right? It definitely did not. If you look at this graph, there was even a year where the profits decreased. We're just saying that on average, this is how much it was changing each year. If you averaged all the, the annual differences in profits, this is what you'd end up with. So this is a useful idea in mathematics and in many applications, uh, defining the average rate of change of a function. And it's defined by this expression. Uh, if you look at this quantity, this is really exactly the same thing we just calculated. The numerator is the difference in the output of the function at two different points, and the denominator is the difference between the input values. So in the previous example, the A was 2005 and the B was 2010. That way B minus A gave us 5. That's what we divided by in the last example. We divided by 5, which comes from 2010 minus 2005. The numerator is the difference in the output values of the function. If you plug in 2010 and 2005, you get the profit in 2010 minus the profit in 2005. And that's exactly how we came up with the $13.2 million that was in the numerator of our rate of change in the last example. So this is a more general way of trying to describe what we mean by average rate of change by this formula. And we can calculate this over any interval as long as we have a function to work with, either a formula for a function or a graph or a table of values. If we're working on an application problem and the function and the units, uh, the function and the variable have units, then so does the rate of change. Uh, for example, in the last problem, the function we were looking at, the profit, had units of millions of dollars, and the variable time was measured in units of years. Therefore, our rate of change was in millions of dollars per year. Millions of dollars in the numerator divided by years in the denominator. On the other hand, if your function doesn't have units or if it's not an application problem, then we generally don't need to worry about the units. Uh, and we'll just express our answer as a formula, a number, etc. So let's look here at a really simple example of a, a function without an application so that we don't have to worry about the units yet. Find the average rate of change of this function, f of x equal x squared, over this interval. So notice the interval here is given an interval notation. This is the same as saying that x is between the values of 1 and 5. x is at least 1 and at most 5. So to find the average rate of change, What we need to compute is the value of the function at the end point 
minus the value of the function at the starting point, all divided by the endpoint minus the starting point. Notice that this is the same expression we just defined. The function at the endpoint minus the function at the starting point divided by the endpoint minus the starting point. By endpoint and starting point, I'm referring to the endpoint and the starting point of the interval for the x values. All right, so let's evaluate this. Uh, f of 5, that's 5 squared, 25. Minus f of 1, that's 1 squared, which is 1. Uh, divided by 5 minus 1, we can simplify that to get 4. 25 minus 1 is 24, and so this simplifies to just 6. And there were no units in this problem, so we don't have to worry about units in our answer. The average rate of change is 6. Next, let's look at an application problem where there are units involved. In this case, our function is describing the temperature as a function of time. So in particular, after t hours after dawn, the temperature outside is given by this formula, 40 plus 2t. So for example, at dawn, t would be 0, and the temperature outside would be 40 degrees. Two hours later, t would be 2, and so the temperature would be f of 2, which would be 44 degrees. So if this is accurate, we would like to know what was the average rate of change of the temperature during the first three hours after dawn. What does that mean, the first three hours after dawn? So you're starting at dawn, and you're watching the temperature for three hours. So you're going from t equals 0 to t equals 3. And basically, what we want to do here is find the average rate of change for this function when t is on the interval between 0 and 3. So we use our formula again. Our average rate of change is going to be f of 3 minus f of 0 divided by 3 minus 0. Uh, f of 3 is 46. f of 0 is 40. And you can see that this is going to simplify to 46 minus 40 is 6, divided by 3 is 2. But this problem had units. The numerator of our fraction was telling us the temperature in degrees. The denominator was telling us how much time had passed in hours. Therefore, this quantity, this rate of change, has units of degrees per hour. And if you think about it, this makes sense. Based on the formula we were given, it makes sense that the temperature was increasing at an average rate of 2 degrees per hour. In fact, according to this formula, it was increasing at a constant rate of 2 degrees per hour. Let's finish this up by making a connection with something that we've studied previously in algebra. If you think about what we're doing when we calculate the average rate of change over an interval, let's say the interval between x equals a and x equals b. Well, we're using the value that x starts at, maybe a, and the value the function takes there, which would be f of a. We're using the value of the function at another point when x is b. And the quantity we're calculating turns out to be the same thing that we would get if we tried to evaluate the slope of the line that connects those two points. So this curve that I started with was the graph of my function. The two points that are illustrated here correspond to the starting point and the ending point during which we evaluate our average rate of change. And if you calculate the slope of the line that goes through both of those points on the graph, you end up exactly calculating the average rate of change. So this is another way to think of average rate of change. It represents the slope of the line, the straight line, that connects those two points on the graph. Even if the function itself is not a straight line, even if the function is curving around like this one is, you can still evaluate the slope between those two points by connecting them with a straight line. And the slope of that line is the average rate of change over that interval.